Of those Owen. Okay, it was the Zoom voice that advised us that. Uh, it started recording. So uh, thank you for your patience, the, for those who were waiting in the waiting room. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, hi everyone, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, I'm Alessandra Saviotti. I work as curator and educator, and I'm also a long-term collaborator of the Association de Arte Util. And I'm currently um, a PhD researcher at the Liverpool John Moores University School of Art and Design. Um, this is uh, the fourth and last panel discussion as part of the Centralizing Political Economies Roaming Symposium, uh, which is an event in collaboration with uh, the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, the City Lab at the Liverpool John Morse University and the Association d'Arte Util. Um, this symposium is conceived as a research-led event uh, which developed over a month. Oh, a lot, a more or less more than a month because we had the first event the 19th of October and uh, it included a broad range of art practitioners such as artists, curators, academics, independent researchers and constituencies who apply art as a tool to be used as a resource for social, economical and political change. Uh, and I see many of the participants uh, that are here today. So um, thank you for being here with us uh, again. So I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our guests who are here today, artists, professors and activists, Susan Lacey and Tanya Bruguera, and the Whitworth director, Alistair Hudson. It's really, really an honor to have you here with us. Um, so some house rules first. Uh, we kindly ask you to stay on mute for the conversation and uh, at the end uh, there will be some time for Q&A. So it would be great if you could type the, the, your questions into the chat box uh, and we'll make sure that we'll go through them. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly say some words about what happened so far and then I leave the, the floor to Alistair who is going to moderate the discussion today. Uh, as I was saying, this is the fourth panel uh, and we are going to talk about the instituting as praxis. And in case you are interested in the others, uh, you will find the recordings um, on the website uh, and I'm going to just paste the link in a minute in the chat and we also have a youtube channel so you can catch up uh, if you are interested in doing so so over the span of a month we also had four workshops aiming at developing some tools uh, or exercise or a series of questions that arose from each activity uh, that are going to be available in the coming months because the idea uh, that leads the symposium and the centralizing political economies as a platform in general is that it might become and function as a sort of collaborative syllabus or a toolkit in and of itself where we could always co go back later um, in five years, uh, in six years, who knows. So we discussed a lot of topics during the previous meetings that of course I won't mention all of them here because otherwise I would take all the time and I really don't want to do that. Uh, but what I wanted to mention is that um, is uh, that we what emerged was such a wide texture of practices across different places and i think it's uh, uh, really interesting to to you know like have the possibility to reflect on uh, on on that also on a later stage for example through uh, the workshops we look at dreams that can be used as experiential knowledge tools or the, the idea of the coefficient of art or the idea of digging where we stand in order to reposition ourselves in our different localities uh, we look at like the relationship between neoliberalism our life and the imagination and um, we talk about hacking as a strategy for the centralizing political economy and how to reclaim the economy as a social activity through art. So many, many different things. And uh, I hope that we will have the possibility also beyond the symposium to discuss more about that. Uh, so say that I'm quite looking forward to this discussion because we are going to specifically address the role of institutions and if instituting might be considered as a praxis and how. Uh, so in fact, we are going to hear in a minute from Susan Lacey, Tanya Bruguera and Alistair Hudson, who, uh, whether in very different ways, have all been literally tried to um, actively use and reposition art as a tool to provoke change. Uh, for example, precisely by intervening directly within institutions, not only the artistic one, or starting some from scratch. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Alistair Hudson, 
and uh, thank you again for being here with us. Great, thank you so much, Alessandra. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with my two favorite artists in the world, uh, <laughs> who also both have exhibitions opening this week. Uh, in fact, the same night, Thursday, right? So Tanya is opening an exhibition at PAC in Milan, and Suzanne is opening her exhibition, uh, What Kind of City? A Manual for Social Change at the Whitworth on Thursday night. And um, I think what's, what's also interesting to note for me is, is just thinking it through there, that these are two artists that really shaped my way of seeing the world and my way of doing in the world and who were both really playing a substantial part in how we are shaping the Whitworth as, a, as an institution for the future. We are also opening on Thursday night as well as Suzanne's show, which asks the question, how can we make a, a better, more equitable city to live in? We are also opening the new office of Arte Util um, in the Whitworth itself, which will be a new research center and the director's office and a common room and a community space. Um, and in a way, these two operations acting as the brain or the software for how we, how we move forward in the future um, with the Whitworth. Um, I should also point out that I'm actually speaking to you from a pub, which is also why I'm quite happy, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting pub because it's um, one that is in the Lake District in the north of England that has now been uh, taken over and saved by the local community with Grisdale Arts, where I used to work and where I first met Tanya, where Tanya came to see me many, many years ago um, at the beginnings of um, Arte Util. Um, but the pub is really a kind of a work in progress. It is an artwork, but it is using the mechanisms of art uh, to produce itself, but also to, in terms of economics and so on, to actually um, hybridize these two worlds together. Um, and I think the other thing worth noting as well is that we, we, we're having this discussion in the context of economics. Um, and this is this has formed a major part of the work that we've been um, doing at the Whitworth um, since I started. And this question of economy and, and reclaiming it for people uh, uh, in the broadest possible way. Um, and we started this process with an exhibition that um, Poppy curated at the Whitworth um, in 2019 um, called A Joy Forever, which was based upon John Ruskin's lecture on political economy that he delivered in Manchester in 1857 to berate the capitalists of Manchester for the way they basically got economics wrong and that really economics should be understood as uh, a way of living, the operating system for society, good housekeeping as it was known um, in, in other, in other um, ways back then, not the kind of fiscal and financial systems that we, we, we understand economics to be now. Um, so this project really started with that exhibition um, uh, but has now developed a long-term research program of which this, uh, this session is part of and the DP website is part of. And all this work will culminate in 2023 with an exhibition at the Whitworth called Economics the Blockbuster, which is sort of um, the most um, un-blockbuster friendly subject matter to deal with in a, in a, in a gallery, but um, that was part of the play. But the idea of the project really is to demonstrate how art and artists and art related ideas can have an impact uh, in genuine ways on the way that we run our societies and the way we run our communities and how we can reclaim um, these systems for, um, for a more equitable and fairer way of living. So that's sort of the framework in which we're, um, in, 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 in which we're thinking and uh, in which we want to hear a little bit more in detail from both Tanya and Suzanne um, about their work. And then after they've both presented, we can, we can open up discussion a little bit further. So I, I'm gonna suggest that we, um, we, we make a start. And I think Suzanne, you're going to um, present to us first. If I can hand the floor over to you. you might need to unmute. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, I am not the most technologically proficient person. 
but I think I can figure this one out. Um, so I don't really know what, uh, it's interesting, Alistair and I, he's been trying to brief me on um, the, the ideas of your project and I'm quite new to it. And I really don't quite approach the idea of economics in the way that I think that Alistair is trying to do. And, I, and it's a very intriguing idea. I'm reminded of a friend of mine, Jody Evans, the founder of Code Pink, who has been talking to me for a couple of years now about the idea of the- My local glasses? Hello? Did somebody say something? I think it was just uh, a, bit of a breakthrough in yeah. the chat. Talking to me about the local peace economy. And I can talk to you a little bit more about that, but I think it might be really fitting in with a certain uh, lens on, on war uh, with uh, the ideas that you're exploring. But Alistair and I uh, were talking about both the, the large, I mean, I definitely think about money and economics and class and work. Those sort of are, are very uh, present in most of my work and have been for a long time. Um, but, but, the, but the issue about, I guess the way I would sort of enter this conversation is the issue about the, the, the macro history of economics, like um, I encountered here in Pindle with the Circle and the Square, uh, a project uh, sponsored by Super Slow Ways, and, um, or, or perhaps the intimate. I've worked with people who are quite poor. I myself came from a working class family, and I'm really interested in the strategies of the poor. For example, yard sales. You would call them boot sales. So, so I think you're talking about something that brings these ideas together, and I find it, I find it really intriguing. Uh, the Circle in the Square started around 2015. Uh, I was invited by a small art project called uh, In Situ to work with them in a town of about 30,000 uh, people in uh, Lancashire area. And as many of you know, uh, the Lancashire area is, um, you know, a, a de, uh, what de-industrialized now. The mills have all gone, the, the industry's gone, the mills are still there and the mills are being um, either falling into the ground or they're being renovated. And this one, the Smith and Nephew mill was being um, renovated. And there was a fear because this mill sits, it's gonna be, that was gonna end up being high-end apartments for Manchesterites because this mill sits right on the other side of this canal is a, a, train, a train track. And in, in our country, they talk about being on the, from the other side of the tracks, meaning uh, a more impoverished area. And I think there was a lot of fear in the beginning that this place was gonna become yet another example of, of the, uh, it, you know, the chasm between the rich and the poor in this country, um, in this country, other countries. As you probably know, living here, the, the um, the textile mills needed practiced labor and they brought people in largely from Pakistan and India over the years, particularly in the 60s. And these people married and, and had families and became part of British culture, but also separated in one respect in that they didn't socialize in the pubs and they didn't uh, share church practices. Um, but over the years, as this, um, as the mills, particularly in the 90s, the mills became more and more defunct. The, the industry, with several implications, one, of course, was increasing poverty and lack of jobs and things that happen when uh, young people have to leave home in order to find work. But the other thing that happened that I was interested in is that this increasing separation between cultures. When I got to Pendle, even the schools weren't integrated. Um, you know, that people ship their kids to different schools depending upon their ethnicities. And you can see how that would happen. The only place that one would quote socialize would be in ASDA because you don't have other forms of socialization which did take place within eight to 10 hour working days. So I um, um, challenged Paul Hartley, that's him with the blonde hair leaning over, to um, let's put together a project that really operates on scale with, with this region. Um, maybe a thousand people should be involved in the project. And he gulped and uh, because like most 
uh, localized organizers, he's used to organizing twin, 10, 15, 30 people, 50 people. And, but we set out on a series of events to build a constituency between Muslims and uh, Pakistani Muslims and white Christians uh, in this uh, region. At the dinners, it was interesting. We met um, these Sufi chanters who had already had a practice of opening up their uh, culture and uh, by sharing uh, Sufi le chanting lessons, dicker lessons. Um, and so over time, we be conceptualized a project that would work with dicker lessons, people um, from other backgrounds and Muslim backgrounds learning chanting and shape note music, which is originally from the Lancashire area. And that gentleman with the big white beard is a southerner from Kentucky. We also, I worked with Massimiliano Molona, uh, the economist, um, to interview people from the mill. And, and the, by the end of the project, we interviewed about 75 people on subjects of race, discrimination, um, uh, the future economy of the region and their hopes for it and the current social situations. And then after about a year and a half, we had a three-day performance and that performance um, featured a series of events that took place over the three days. One was a series of mill tours for people who had worked there and had not been back in the mills for 20 or 30 years. We played the um, their we, we got more interviews and we played their interviews. But one of the main things, we had mill workers tea, we had evening receptions and so on. One of the main things they did was become part of, be able to be part of this installation process of the filming that would take place on the third and final day of the performance. And on that day, uh, we created the circle lessons and the square lessons for a small audience and filmed it. Later, we had 500 people uh, come to dinner. And subsequent to that, there have been uh, the three org participating organizations put in um, various grants uh, and received a lot, of, uh, a lot of them to do various kinds of work, like this is the Nashi Boys Choir. I'm going to uh, play a three minute.
and you'll see this installation. Um, hey, 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 hey. Of this projection in uh, at the Whitworth opening opening tomorrow night, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this next project, but just to point out um, the, another project I've been doing with Alistair called Uncertain Futures. How am I doing for time? Have I hit eight minutes or ten minutes? Do we know, Alessandra? I think you're fine, Suzanne. Don't don't worry. All right, so this, this project is uh, also following on, on the hills of a project uh, that Tanya did at Manchester Art Gallery with the same pretty amazing uh, staff there. We've been, I've been working for almost two years since the beginning, well, in fact, since the beginning of COVID on a project called Uncertain Futures with this group of 15 women um, who was carefully selected for their leadership positions in various communities, and they have been We've, we've been we, uh, meeting weekly for an hour and a half for uh, two years now and designing a project which is in, has finished phase one and is now entering with what kind of city uh, phase two. And just to explain briefly, we of course met, I just met them for the first time, all of them on Monday, but I, I feel like I, I know them. We've been working together so for so long. We've sort of created a plan of the advisory group and from that they would select a hundred women from diverse communities who would be interviewed uh, in partnership with two scholars from the university who work on issues of aging and policy. Um, and we've um, collected those interviews in, uh, you know, these are just the sort of work notes that we've gone through. Um, and the project has, I think, been profoundly um, intersectional in its issues, and these explain the carefully thought through with the group kinds of issues, race, gender, migration, disability, class, and age, uh, with, you know, the idea of age and gender kind of underlying everything. And we've looked at and are doing through really legitimate, I think, very, what will be very impactful research results uh, access to work, in work experiences, the impact of COVID and work aging and retirement. Um, so we invited the 100 women and um, installed in one of the galleries at, uh, at the MAG, we um, installed a painting and a window. And within this window, people could come and see people being interviewed. Um, you see the, the interview in progress sign on. Now on the other side is another piece that I did at Manchester Art Gallery called Cleaning Conditions in a 2015 show called Do It with Hans Ulrich Oberst. And that homage to Alan Capro is a whole different project, but it was based on similarly, and there you can see it across the room from the interview, is the Ford Maddox Brown uh, painting and a new video installation of cleaning conditions. And of course, all of these deal with the idea of labor. And when you're not, when an interview is not going on, you can um, hear a soundtrack recorded of those advisors uh, and text by, um, also by Mark Thomas. And when we're not in there interviewing, people can go in and sit down and they can read an interview that's been um, anonymized and uh, they can listen to the soundtrack. And here are some of the members of the advisory group having our picture taken in this square. And this space now in phase two converts to um, a meeting area for these women to continue working with Alistair and completing the project with some policy briefs and a dinner for the 100 women. So that's, uh, that's what I have to share tonight. Alistair, over to you. Great, thank you, Suzanne. Um, yeah, and I should probably just, just, just quickly elaborate as well that it, 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 in the concept um, for the show um, that we're doing with Suzanne across both galleries in a way originated when uh, we, we were all together 
um, way, way, way back um, when, when we did the Escuela de Arte Util at uh, YBCA in San Francisco, and we discussed with, our, with the colleagues over the road at SF MoMA, who were also doing a, a retrospective, planning a retrospective of your work, how do you do an exhibition of work like this? And that conversation evolved over time and actually evolved through COVID um, to produce the exhibition in its form now, which is this idea of the show as a manual. So you use the work in the show in order to enable and, and, and form new projects with people in the city that are relevant for its context and actually have some kind of effect. So our, we, we, the, the idea is that in March next year, at the, at the end of the exhibition, there'll be a kind of uh, four day symposium on the key subject areas of the show, which will basically be an ask to the city um, to make policy changes in areas around the ones um, Suzanne just highlighted around community cohesion, around um, uh, the intersectionality of work, race, class, and, and with women over 50, um, on youth agency, um, and on borders as well. So um, that, in a way, that's the, that's the thematic that we'll be, we'll be pursuing. So, um, but we can talk more about that um, later on as well, I think, and how that in a way starts to affect um, the institution itself, how the institution works in the future, because it is quite a change from the standard gallery model. Um, and also I think obviously how that then affects the wider economy of the city, i.e. the ecology of the city and how everybody lives and works together. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that for later and jump now uh, to Tanya in Milan. Tanya, can you hear us? Are you, how's your tech? I can see your mute sign. You may be, may be struggling a little bit here. Tanya, can you send us a message? Or oh, Alessandra, could you, um, have you got a mobile? Yeah, mute? yeah. Tanya? Um, just a sec. Sorry about this, everybody, but this is the world of Zoom. <laughs> We've all got very accustomed to over the last two years. She may have disappeared, but we could, I mean, is it worth, we could just pick up the conversation for a moment whilst we try and get Tanya um, into play. Um, and it, I just wonder if it's worth Suzanne as well. You, you think about how you how you see that ambition for the show because it's all very well, you know, us inviting you and us developing these ideas, and you know, at some point, you know, you go back to LA and or you know, you onto the next project in Moscow or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested at this point, two days before opening, how you uh, how are you feeling about it? Uh, you need to unmute, I'm afraid. Okay. Well, I, 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 um, I think this, just to backtrack a little bit, what, when uh, Alistair and I were talking at the SF MoMA uh, and YBCA um, installation retrospective I had, I had said to him that, you know, the thing that happens in museums is that they ask you, uh, to, um, they want you to do a project. They always want you to do a project. At least they want me to do a project. And mostly they have absolutely no idea how to do a project. And they have even less idea how, how much it costs, and what kind of time and what kind of caring it takes to do a project. And I'm sure Tanya will find, you know, does find the same experience. I think all of us working in this way do. And, and I said to him, you know, what would be really interesting to do? I mean, it would be fine if you want to reshow this work, but what would excite me is to really think through how you activate a space and, and have a project. And so we talked about the fact, remember Alistair, that I couldn't be everywhere and do every kind of project, but that there would might be a sort of a, a model established and um, a mentorship created that could allow us to, to push your agenda further. And that's really started me off on a, on a whole other train of thinking, which I very much appreciate 
with with the VAC Foundation and with Sally Talent at Queens and to some degree with the Serpentine and definitely with what kind of city. I've been thinking about how, you know, what does an institution have to have or do or be in order to reconfigure itself into a social practice institution? And, and, and it's, not, it's not easy. I mean, I've worked in, you know, Tate Modern, I've worked in big museums, but I began my career producing my own work, raising my own money, setting up my own staff, my own teams, everything. And so, so for me, the difficulty of this work is, is um, I mean, it's kind of laughable even to think that somebody, that a museum like SF MoMA, uh, certainly when Dominique Wilson was there, they could have handled it, but once he was gone, there wasn't anybody that knew how to do this kind of work. So the idea of me, even I told him at the beginning, forget it, I'm not, uh, I'm not doing a project with you guys. That's kind of like the kiss of death for me. It'll put us all under. Mm -hmm. um, but when Alistair talked about it, I thought, well, you know, that's that's really interesting. I've worked in Manchester a lot. There's a lot of resources here. And Matt Alistair, you know, you're one of I think you're one of the lead curators in this in this sort of small niche way of thinking. And um, and so I figured it would be really fun to try this new model out. Of, and I think it remains to be seen because in a way we're sort of foraging in the darkness. You know, this week we are trying to convene, Alistair and I have had these great ideas about what we'd like to see happen next. But now on Friday, we're, we're bringing people from all these four projects together, not all of whom have been very prepared. And I think it'll be very interesting to see if our, our visions and our fantasies can evolve into something something real uh, because that is the challenge of this work there are people who are philosophers and theorists of it and then there are people who are you know down in the trenches doing it and i think bringing those two sort of forms of action together are is very very important great and uh, talking of forms of action coming together uh i can see tanya moving are you <laughs> uh are you picking us up tanya Tanya, Tanya. Oh, can you cut your, your on mute oh, as I'm well? Sorry. So if you, oh, that's okay. Yeah. I can hear you. The internet here is not very good. Yeah. Yeah, is it hotel internet? Um, so thank you for inviting me. For me, it's a very... Uh, is a very um, special union there uh, today to uh, talk about Arte uh, about uh, Instar. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, it's, it, it was, yeah. Let's keep going. I'm going to take off my video so it's easier because okay. the internet is not very good. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Um, and we're going to have his images. So Ale, if you want to put the images on. Sure. In the screen. Yeah. Okay, they are on, Tanya. Ah, no, I've been talking about my... So I was saying that I'm very glad to be here today because I'm with my family and some of the people I love the most in the world. And, um, and well, Alessandra invited me to talk about INSTAR as one of the practices or the projects I've been doing more recently related to institutions. So basically, what I have done is uh, for many years, I have done institutions because uh, because Cuba, <laughs> because there you don't have any institution that works and uh, you have a minister of culture that slap an artist in the middle of the street and see how all the artists are being put in a bus 
um, and hear the scream of the artists that have been beaten by the police and he's doing nothing. So in a place like that, where also for going out in the street and saying we want freedom, you get 23 years of jail that just happened to a bunch of people. Then of course you need institutions as the forefront of um, the idea of a civic society and of a place you can live. So art as always is substituting reality for me and uh, in a way creating the space that I cannot have uh, as a citizen and I create it through art. So at least we can experience what it would be if things were different. So um, it started, started uh, because I, I tried to do a performance in the streets of Havana. I got detained in 2015. And in one of the interrogation session, I, I had to explain the interrogator the difference between art and uh, I mean, what performance was and all of this. And I did it not as, um, as a way to, to play a smart ass. I did it because I was trying to save my life out of prison. But in the process of talking with her, I say, you know what, maybe what these people need is more education and knowing more. I have a big uh, faith in knowledge, uh, you know. And, um, and then I say, okay, maybe I do this uh, in more, constant way. So I did uh, this performance, which is basically sitting for 100 hours, reading and discussing the work of Anna Arendt, The Origin of Totalitarianism. And I did this in the concept of the Havana Biennial, because I knew that the government was going to use this international gathering to, uh, you know, try to mess up my image or and so on. And I was completely right. A few days after, they were saying that I enter an exhibition and make a scandal, which is completely fake. And I also said I could prove it because for this piece, I self survey myself. So I put a camera and I survey 100 hours myself inside the space. You can put next, please. Of course, the reaction of the, um, of the government was because the sound could travel freely. They brought this uh, group of, uh, you know, to, to fix the, the house, the, the street that they never ever fixed in 20 years. They wanted to fix that day. <laughs> so the sound of the hack jammers could not let me read. Next. And then I realized maybe we need to stop doing events and single actions. And we need to start thinking about commitment, about long-term co social commitment and long-term um, um, institutions, no? And, and I work also like, like uh, Suzanne in long-term projects. So I decided uh, that I was going to create a, a, an effort that is going to be for civic uh, education next. Um, and of course, uh, what we have done, uh, the project is divided in different uh, aspects, but the project is really live. It's a live organism. So by that we mean that we react to what is happening, that we have the basics, for example, civic education is one of the basic, um, uh, reasons of existence of the project. Next. Um, next, we're going to see many images of us having workshops and next and doing our work in the street where people are encountering Cubans or here in the barber shop, they are reading uh, something or here we have some um, African-Americans uh, meeting Afro-Cuban Afro-descendant or in the next one, we'll see how a person is explaining a book about political violence. Or the next, you'll see how we invite, and we do the same. This is almost the second part of Arte de Conducta, the Catedral Arte de Conducta, but while Arte de Conducta next was um, uh, also brought people from abroad to explain what was um, art and political art and so on, we keep this invitation. Now we are online because um, the COVID, but also because we had uh, attempt from the government to take the house 
So we're doing online and also because a lot of people are afraid to go to the house itself. So we realized that online people can be anonymous and we have this weird thing where when we are doing the, the live events, we have maybe seven or eight people looking. And as soon as it end, uh, maybe the next day we have like 700 to 2000 people who saw the video. So basically that shows, it's almost like we're doing a survey about how willing people are to be upfront with what they think and their relationship with the comments, the, the, the knowledge that we are sharing. Next. Yeah, next. Mm -hmm. So basically we are dividing this in three different uh, elements. One is, uh, which I hope some of you will be invited for next year, cycle um, we do this kind of academicas meaning academic mean like something more like workshops and stuff online then we do something um, we do three a week that's on Monday Wednesday we do stratos which means that we are looking back at the history of activism in Cuba and histories that nobody's tell, told. For example, right now we have done uh, cycles on different activist groups. Um, and now we are doing something that is quite interesting because we are doing something called Los Hijos de Papa, meaning the spoiled kids of, uh, of the, the spoiled kids of those who are in the government. No? That's how you call it uh, in, in the street. And um, but it's interesting because we're showing a demographic that usually is, uh, you think it's just these bourgeois kids that are using the privilege, but we're showing the other face. We show the kids are rebellious, like myself, against their, their official parents, you know? So, and the next, and, and Fridays we do this more relaxing when we invite poets and writers and musicians to talk about the work and read and, you know, something more relaxing. So next. We have also done um, a, a lot of, uh, it's interesting because in STAR, we started as a second part of Arte de Conducta and a, a very clear pedagogical environment uh, for art and activism has evolved next into uh, many events. For example, we have, and we opening this next week, uh, the four to the 11, we are doing film festivals. We are doing uh, edi editions, we are editing books. We are like, it's growing very fast because basically INSTAR is uh, an organism that uh, knows what is missing in this kind of, um, in this kind of, um, uh, como se llama? this kind of uh, in political and social environment. So it's trying to cover all the holes in order to create um, a texture, a social texture that is um, uh, creating the next steps on our behavior and also on our political uh, knowledge. Next, next. And now there are many, so you can pass while I'm talking. So basically, um, we have done a lot of events. We have done alternative biennials, alternative uh, uh, film festivals, keep going on to say social. And, um, and it has become a place that when we could open, uh, it was a place of fear that people love to go. Um, but uh, we are also doing a research right now for Documenta. Uh, we've been invited to Documenta as a project and we are doing this, um, this yeah, stop there. This uh, research, the first time that, that a history of alternative art, um, independent art practice is going to be shown as its own uh, you know, history. And this is very important because the government had um, very intensely said that we are just two or three crazy people and that has no connection with anything else. And I have, with a group of people working in this timeline where we can see the history of people attempting to do uh, alternative institution, attempting to do alternative editorial houses, printing houses, schools and so on that were completely, you know, 
um, destroyed and also alternative art exhibition and so on. So yeah, we also have this uh, very quickly. We also, you can go, please. Uh, we have this also social practice and presence where we are helping next uh, when there are big disasters, like for example, with the hurricane and stuff, we, we, we were giving uh, medicines and, uh, you know, like the, the normal things that government also didn't cover very quickly. Next. So basically we are, um, you know, next. Uh, we also have this system where we give awards and we have a history of Cuba war giving to a book that researched the Anon toll history. Um, we also give cinema. We have uh, six uh, cinema prizes. We have residencies uh, for artists who do social art, but also for non-artists who want to do uh, social projects. And we help them with the artistic um, endeavor, you know, the, how to look, you know, how to make it more interesting, not just a social project, no? So next, um, these are the awards, investigative journalism, ah, but see, history, film, and yeah. And we also have Instar Award, which is an award that we give to recognize people who for many, many years have been doing this, the same kind of work, independent work, civic work, and it's not recognized. Gogo, go. uh, yeah, this is the film awards. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. Then this is the Vita Activa, is the name of the art residency that is social art. These are two next. These are the first residency. Uh, is the editorial, independent editorial. And also we have another guy who is working with alternative ways um, of producing education for kids. And, and bring in recycled mentality, you know, uh, and ecological mentality. So yeah, we also doing um, archive. We are rescuing archive from previous projects. And this is because in Cuba, of course, next, you don't have, uh, you don't have memory or people don't keep stuff. So we want to make sure that we, we only keep the archive on, um, online, we don't digitally. We don't want to acquire, we don't want the responsibility of the object uh, because we know we are an institution or so a project, art project using the shape of an institution that cannot, you know, anytime they can enter and take our stuff. Literally yesterday, uh, Monday, our designer and collaborator, permanent collaborator travel and, the, and in the airport, the police said to her, she cannot travel with her computer. And of course she was living with the computer of Insta with a lot of information. So we can save some of the information. And uh, yeah, at the end she say, I don't go if you take the computer. So they let her go. But you know, so we are in this kind of very precarious situation. So we cannot be responsible of very valuable objects. And also we want to make things free and available for everyone. We are a, a project and I'm finishing soon. Next, next, next. Um, that we do also campaigns for next against some of the next, against some of our colleagues that are in prison or against some of the laws that uh, do not uh, help uh, us. We are also a project that uh, is thought, yeah, you can keep that. We are also a project, and this is the last one. We are also a project that um, one uh, was created thinking in the future. This idea that we talk a lot about living the future today or, or preparing the future today, uh, because we know, and this is a, a, a little distress that the project has, that we are not a pleasant project because we are uh, demanding to the institutions to do things they are not doing, to behave in ethical way they don't behave. But also we are demanding to the people coming to the project to behave and to be the citizen. They might not be ready to be yet because they are afraid or because they don't have enough, uh, you know. So yes, this is part of, um, of the challenges of the project, but I think without challenges is boring. So 
<laughs> we love it. And uh, this, I want to finish with this image. I have another one too, we can also show. But this is the image that for me result in the end of the project. Not, I mean, we're still going, but it's like one of the moments, better moments of the project where, can you put the previous one? Where uh, more, than six, more than 500 artists, uh, which many of them were part of our workshops and follow us, but many of these artists, uh, 500 artists came in front of the Ministry of Culture to demand to the Minister of Culture to recognize independent art practice and also to defend artists against all the repression of the government and the police. At the moment, there were some artists in prison. Like today, we still have people in prison. So next. After that day, we were promised a dialogue, which never happened. And this is in start with like the core members of that group trying to prepare an agenda to dialogue with the government. And of course it was sabotaged by the government, but at least we, we tried. Thank you so much. I think it's more than eight minutes, but <laughs> I tried to speak quick. Don't worry, it's amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Tanya. It's really, really good to see the images from that as well and get a taste of it. I think it's 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 quite hard for us in our cosy world in uh, in the UK to kind of understand the conditions that you're operating in there. And, you know, we're kind of seeing it from afar and hearing what's happening through, you know, various channels. Um, but in a way, I, I, one of my first questions, I think is quite a, quite a practical one, which is, you know, Suzanne was talking about, you know, having the resources to, to for institutions to do this stuff. Um, and I was kind of wondering maybe if you could just talk a little bit about how you resource Instar in these you know, very extreme conditions. I know you did, you did a very um, you know, effective crowdfunder at the start, mm -hmm. but um, how, how are you managing to maintain mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it's, it's very hard. So first of all, in terms of economy, for us it's complicated because the Cuban government any independent, any, like this is like a canon, you know, any independent project, no matter what area it is, if it is in the social science or the arts or, or anything, that they, they have qualified as challenging to them or critical to them or whatever. The first um, uh, defamation they do is to say that it's paid by the CIA which is completely ridiculous. But uh, knowing that, um, I knew that before, even before creating the project, I had to do two things. First, a survey to see if people wanted the project. So the crowdfunding was good, not only because we did a very good crowdfunding, but it was also a way to have a survey to see how many people were excited about the project. So we could say this project is not an artist who wants to do this, it's just so many people want the project, you know? So this is good. The other thing is, and I am going to be completely transparent here because this is recorded and you are my friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the crowdfunding was very successful. We put $99,000, which is a lot of money. But I also have to say that a lot of the <laughs> like pieces that I sold and during that time or, or fees that I was going to get for exhibitions, I told the museums instead of give it to me to put it for the crowdfunding. You know, so I have to honestly say that, that as well. Um, the money is gone, of course, after five years. I tried to stretch it as much as possible. But uh, the prices, I give, we give a lot of money for the prices in Cuban standards. So it's $5,000 per, per, per film project. There are five, so it's already $25,000 and, and so on. So it's a lot of money there. We also have this idea of fair pay, which is unusual to hear in Cuba. Um, and for example, during the pandemic, we gave people their salary, even if we were not working so much. So... I think it is not only the money, but also how, what do we do with the money and what are the ethics behind the money? So uh, this idea of fair pay is something that nobody, and this is something I'm very proud of, and I know it's not very humil 
humble to say this, but I am very proud that many times we talk about concepts in Instar that maybe a year later, even the government takes these concepts, even if they don't do it right, but at least they address it. For example, we have been talking about transparency, institutional transparency, fair pay to the workers, and all these concepts that are supposed to be normal. And before they, 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 uh, you know, they push us back with that, but when they see we are very strong about these concepts, and thinking money is not about having access, and it's also about how the ethics of distribution, then they start using this, you know, so it's very interesting. So now it's basically, when I sell an artwork, the money goes where it goes. <laughs> I just got a price in Spain and where the money's going, like the people in the newspaper asked me, I didn't have to wait one second to answer. I said, well, to Instar, that's the next, budget of Instar for next year, <laughs> you know. So fortunately, I'm not very good at finding money in that sense of, of creating a, you know, self-sustained situation. Now we're going to start thinking about NFTs and Bitcoins. So uh -huh. we also find out, yeah, we are exploring this since uh, four months. We are studying this possibility. And also Bitcoin, why? Because there are many people who are more willing to give money in Bitcoin because they, I don't know why, maybe psychologically. And um, yeah, this is some things we are exploring at the moment. We just, we just not made, there yet, but. We just made an NFT at the Whitworth, Tanya. From, nice. from, from a William nice. Blake, but all, nice. the pro, all the proceeds are being directed into social projects. So it's kind of like a, a Robin Hood Steal nice. for the to give to the poor NFT. So we can that's perfect. <laughs> we, can, we can exchange notes on NFTs on NFTs. I like I like what yeah, I have to learn. Let me tell you something. I like a lot when money becomes ironic. <laughs> you know, the economies become a source of irony. I love that. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah, as, as an added irony, Poppy and I have been working on this economics project, and we've even used emergency culture recovery money from the, from the pandemic from the government into projects so, nice. <laughs> so yeah that, that, that adds a yeah a kind of another poetry to it i think <laughs> um I, I was going to say now we're we're um we're kind of into our second hour which is sort of the hour that we allocated for discussion and questions so i just really just want to say to everybody um, do feel free to ask questions now from this moment on. I mean, we can keep talking and I'm sure uh, both of you, you know, maybe have got questions for each other. But if you want to ask a question or say something, um, as um, Alessandra said, if you just type it into the, into the chat box and we'll monitor it. Um, and if you, if you want to say it, um, you're welcome to say it and speak up or if you just want us to read out the question, we can do that as well. Um, so yeah, please please start adding that into the um, yeah into the box there. I was wondering, um, Suzanne, having having seen like the latest news from Cuba, whether you and and your work in um, you know in kind of the, the the southern parts of America, whether whether you had any um, reflections on what Tanya had presented there. Well, I do have reflections on it. I, I was thinking of the utopian quality of uh, what Tanya is trying to do and how that's linked, for example, to the women's building, um, to Grisdale, you know, to various sorts of, of, to the settlement house movement. And, and not that they were necessarily similar in style or ethics or practices, but but the fact that all of them are sort of based on a hope and a dream that people can live, it, find, explore with each other new systems of um, ways of ethical ways of living together. And as I mentioned, my friend Jody Evans, the founder of Code Pink, has is just really given her life over to activism. And she's been with people like William Barber developing this concept of the local peace economy. And her, her work is anti-war. Mine isn't really about war, um, but her work is. And within that, she's exploring 
you know, how do you make peace on a local intimate level? And I think the one thing that all of our projects do is they, they sort of share a, a degree of intimacy and ethical relationship with each other that uh, um, I think you can see throughout social practice, irrespective of its various um, kind of founding principles. I, I see with Tanya, I, I mean, there is not, not only a modeling of the kind of society that she would like to see based on art and equity, but also a kind of a form of resistance. And I think you see to various degrees, like with the Feminist Studio Workshop and the Women's Building, it was resistance to, you know, patriarchy. But I think that, that um, but I also think that its major work was about creating new relationships between women. So, and, and this summer I'm gonna be, um, I've just made acquaintance with a small, uh, utop a former utopian community in California called Allensworth and it, in 1908, um, a black soldier founded a black utopian community in like 30 miles from where I grew up, which believe me was in my lifetime, not you know the, the center for black power, but they're trying to rethink how they can create um, a, a natural farm and economies around this completely barren uh, state park very impoverished area. And, and I just, I think there's something so magical about uh, Tanya's work, about people's work of kind of utopia, vision and resistance, irrespective of the different forms of oppression that people are facing that, that I, I quite respond to. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm also just thinking there, I think also it, with that, one of the challenges that we have is um, as institutions, say, for example, here in the UK, is you adopt a position, you adopt, you know, you transform the, the museum into, you know, basically an active organization. Um, there is equally resistance to that idea that an institution take, takes, takes on these roles when actually, you know, as you pointed out with the settlement movement, this is a very, very long history. Art, art, art has, uh, you know, been, uh, you know, political for a very long time. Um, in, in a way, also, what's, what's more recent is that uh, politics has become cultural in a way that it wasn't before. Tanya, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I totally like a lot what, what you say, Suzanne. Um, I also want to say that in, in terms of Instar, we are a really self-critical para-institution, because we're not really an institution, we're a para-institution, although a lot of people see us as some institution. Because, for example, we are all the time even changing roles of people in the team. For example, if something doesn't work, we're just changing. We're having now a little crisis with, because we think that the communication is not good enough. So we are now changing the person who do communication for another job inside, you know? So it's not about, oh, you're not good. You are going to be, you know, fired. It's about, you are not good at this, but you're good at something. So let's find out what you're good at. And we're going to put you there and you want to be happy and you're going to be, you know, uh, doing a better job. So I think it's, um, it's interesting because also all the changes we do take some time for people to understand, like when we first talk about, okay, communication is not working, uh, she got very nervous and defensive because she thought that was, you know, the side way to say goodbye. And, and we have, I had to say, no, 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 I'm not saying you're going. I'm saying like, what else do you think you can be good at in the project, you know? And I think it's, for me is that, is how can you create different, ecologies of relationship like Susan does in her work that will last longer but also it's about how people see their the uselessness the useness I say being useful uh, how they see themselves being useful for something that is bigger than them and that alone they could not do it you know so I don't know if that yeah that's it I would I would really um emphasize that I think that that you know creating personal resources and personal um, 
um, you know, the, at the root of pedagogy is, I don't think so much delivering information as delivering capacity so that people begin to understand what their capacity is. It is, I, I relate to what you said about finding other roles for people. I've always thought it was a function of the fact that I worked with so many volunteers that, you know, you don't take a person. It's very hard for me to hire in an institutional setting because I can't take a person and, and say, you, you fit my job. Instead, for me, it's kind of like, what do you do? What would you like to do? What's your best, uh, what's the best way to raise you into a position of more power? Uh, so I, I think that's something that is, is very important. I, I get, um, I think self-critical is, um, Tanya, I'm sure it's fundamental to all of our practices. I, I kind of don't like the word self-critical because there is so much of an ecology of criticism right now. Um, you know, there seem, people seem to know a lot more about how to critique than they do how to build alliances. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, but I think as a practice, always questioning why you do what you do and is this the right thing to do and, and allowing yourself, which I know you do, uh, to be open to others and their um, critique of you, their, their feeling that things could be better. I think that's uh, a, really, a, a really wonderful um, way of, of thinking about creating institutions that are based on, um, I mean, I know you keep saying economics um, or the economies of institutions. I think that might be something for us to parse a little bit because Tanya and I are talking in the, in the realm of relationality. Yeah, well, well I think in, in, a, in terms of a, you know, like a-, a oh, you thought that, you thought that... Go ahead, Tanya. Yeah, no, sorry, it's not so. Uh, no, I think this is also a question we ask ourselves. Are we still pertinent to exist, like all the time? Are we, what is the role that we are having? Are we still um, giving, you know, something that is needed? Or are we just, because the one thing about institution, because there is a difference between doing a project that uses the form of an institution than doing a project that become institutionalized. And I think this is for very important. I'm not interested in creating a foundation or that is for real forever existing after I die. I don't care about that. I care about how can we use, like you say, Suzanne, uh, pedagogical systems or so on to create something and to be pertinent to the situation. No? And uh, yeah, so all the time we are thinking, are we still okay? Are we still doing something? And sometimes we change. We say, okay, this is not working now. Oh, for example, in Cuba, because we do civic education, people learn, literally, <laughs> they learn and they apply the stuff that they have learned. And sometimes we say, okay, this is not interesting anymore to do another workshop about how to protest when everybody protests already, you know what I mean? So we have to constantly see what is pertinent for us to do and what can we give that people have not had access to or not think about yet. So it's very, it's a lot of work because it's not just a mechanical, we do everything every week, or it's more about, you know, so this is, uh, yeah. And, and I get very mad, I have to confess, when I see that we are behind. Uh, because I'm always, like, I think Instar is always trying to be politically timing, no? To have the political timing right, no? And sometimes when I get we are too slow or something, I get really pissed off, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, but it's, no, you're, yeah. You've always been too hard on yourself, if you ask me, Tanya. You, you can ask me that, Suzanne, you know, it's impossible to share. <laughs> you know, I, I think um, what this conversation is doing for me is causing me to think of so many examples. I, I love the idea of laying out lots of possibilities and ideas and then seeing how different people approach them. I'm thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, which has many forms and many people. But <clears throat> one of the co-founders was a student of mine and Amelia Jones, who is here with us tonight. And uh, we could both tell you that, that uh, Patrice Cullors 
besides being an artist and really based in art and working with other students of ours to create this sort of Afrofuturist um, space down in the middle of uh, Inglewood called Dairy Mart, but that her, she's a, a really generous, open person thinking about um, relationality of all sorts and oppressions of all sorts with black oppression simply as a model for looking at other sorts of, and, and that's not the image you get of an institution or a, an organization even that is purely founded on resistance. But, but for her, thinking of relationality and thinking of ethical behavior um, is, and thinking of pedagogy, these are all pieces of that puzzle of what it means, I think, to sort of engage in this idea of utopia. I do want to say one other thing, which is length of time. And Tanya, both of us have done very long projects, but I would say there's a significant difference between um, what you're doing in Cuba and what I did in uh, with other people up in uh, Pendle. And that is that you can sort of, even though it continues and other people continue, there's a way that I can extract myself and do something different. And that's more like the traveling, the Chautauqua, um, people in the United States who would travel around and teach and never stay quite in one place. The longest I've done any project was, uh, was in Oakland for 10 years. I worked on a project, but when I left Oakland, then I didn't work on that project anymore. So I just want to call out the, the notion of time and how one makes a commitment to place that is really lifelong, such as what you're trying to do. I, I have to say a few things about that, if, if, the, if I may. One thing, in terms of time, definitely these projects, as we have talked to you and me many times, they need time. They need time to be understood. They need time to be processed. They need time for people to grow together with the project. And this is this project is set in 2005, and we are in 2021. And now, six years later, is that we see this event at the, at the Ministry of Culture. You know, so it needs time to be real and to be natural and not to be fake and impose. The other thing is that um, it's funny because INSTAR has become an umbrella para institution because a lot of people know that we are super ethical and super strict about certain things and about with whom we collaborate, because it is also a project that we want it or not is political. It has become political because it's a political comment. For example, when um, we have been very vocal and now that you said somebody from Black Lives Matter is here, I'm going to tell you a story that is quite painful. We uh, align with the left because that's the inclination the people working in the project have. But for example, when the Cuban police killed the first Afro-descendant Cuban. By the back, uh, we were attacked in Cuba by other activists because we have brought some of the people from Black Lives Matter to give a workshop in Cuba. And they were demanding why Black Lives Matter was not a solidarity with the Afro-descendant population in Cuba, you know? And we were attacked very strongly by other activists. Because, you know, and, uh, you know, I had a talk with one person from Black Lives Matter and so on. But it was very painful to see that sometimes we are not uh, being uh, um, together, let's say, supported by all the people who actually are doing the same thing somewhere else. And uh, by now we have three already, because of this, I guess, we have three uh, Afro-descendant. Uh, Cubans who have been killed by the police and we keep putting the names in social media and so on but nobody is picking up on this you know in, 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 in relationship to that the answer of Black Lives Matter was to talk to the government the government set up they set up this conversation with people who are completely on the side of the government and who are just you know cleaning the image of so it was it's complicated so it's not only 
this happy project where everybody's happy because they're learning about how to be better citizens is a project that is completely porous and a complete battle, not only with things that are wrong or we want to change in the government, but also with other activists, you know, so it's, it's intense. And in, another thing is that INSTAR has become an umbrella, actually, for other projects. And this is for us very happy, like we're very happy about it, but it's a big responsibility, you know, because uh, that means that we work with so many people and somebody get in trouble. So it is, it is um, yeah, so we are not an umbrella where people sometimes approach us to, for support, not only economically, but also because we are respected in Cuba by other activists. So they want to, you know, to share with us this, uh, which we are very happy about, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tanya. Um, I've noticed we've got a couple of questions appeared. So maybe we'll um, go to those. Um, the first one's from um, Andrew Freiband, if I got that right. And uh, Andrew, do you want to ask it yourself? Sure, um, thanks. Uh, just first off, thank you, um, Suzanne and Tanya and Alistair. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, I've, I've followed both of your careers um, for a couple of years, so it's really great to be um, listening to you directly. And uh, so I'm in New York, I'm an art, uh, I'm an artist and, an, and a teacher of artists. Um, I, I am instituting myself. I, I, I sort of have dropped out of conventional academia and have begun developing courses and pedagogies uh, to try and support artists in other ways. And, um, and then I also have, you know, day job wage work for uh, conventional art schools. And I'm often confronted with art students who want to learn the, what we call the business of art. And here in the U.S., um, you know, uh, for any kind of health coverage, pension benefits, uh, you know, uh, tax status, artists have to, and, and in fact, through the pandemic, um, if artists were going to receive unemployment wages or any kind of social benefits, we had to incorporate ourselves. We had to be defined to the state as a company or a corporation. Um, and so a lot of people were thrust into this idea of instituting in a very pra practical and pragmatic way, like, just to exist, um, we had to be institutions. We couldn't be artists um, as individuals. Um, and so I'm curious about you know, how do we responsibly teach the business of art, um, you know, in a context like this where artists must incorporate and must institute, but probably haven't put. I mean, I certainly haven't put as much sort of thought and and time into the nuance of doing so as Tanya was saying. Uh, not to be a real institution, not to set up a foundation or a nonprofit and operate in that space, but simply so that our art, art practice can engage um, in the context in which we find ourselves. Um, you know, and I don't know, it's a, it's a wide open question uh, in terms of, of all the different contexts that we're talking about from the US to Cuba and, the Europe, and to Europe. So I'm just interested in, in any of your thoughts. Well, I, I can address that from my own perspective. Um, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think you have to incorporate. Um, I think that you there's another alternative and it's the path I've always taken, which is to, uh, to have an alternate job. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be in teaching, but before that I was in carpentry. Uh, you know, I've done a little of all kinds of things, everything except waitressing, I think. And um, so, so that is a way to not incorporate. I worked in Oakland for 10 years on projects with teenagers, a series of projects over time. And, and the question came up after the third year about whether or not we should form a nonprofit. And I decided I didn't want to, I wasn't advocating for that. Some of the people on my team were, were really interested in it, but for me, it felt like I, I, I had to think about it a lot because I have friends like Judy Baca who have become a nonprofit institution and a fairly successful one. Um, over 30 years, her organization with an exhibition space and a lab and she produces projects and she teaches for uh, her own income. But, but she's been, and, and there are examples of people that are successful 
at starting turning into an institution that maybe is more of a beneficent one than the one you're 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 talking about. A nonprofit was one of the ways that I think it's a logical step, and it would have worked for us to do that. But I, um, at a certain point, was pretty clear I needed freedom, and I've pretty much set my life up like that. Everything in my life, so that so that I didn't want to become the leader of an institution. Having said that, I do work with and in institutions a lot, mainly academic institutions. And believe me, they've got more bureaucracy and, uh, than, than most places. Uh, but, but, but that seems to be something that I can accommodate because it's apart from my particular passion, which is making art. And, being able to move around and to reshape new ideas and new projects. So I think I think that the issue of teaching business to, to artists, I actually am quite in favor of that. Um, not as a major piece of a curriculum, but I think they need tool sets. I think they, I mean, if you don't have anything else to offer other than get another job and do your art on the side, which frankly I've done my entire life, you know, if that's the only thing you have to offer with a college education, I think you should, in the environment we operate in, you should give them as many tools as, as you can. Tanya, you just started teaching at Harvard, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, with the evil people now. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy there, I have to say. I'm really yeah. happy. How, how, do you, um, how do you think this question is playing out there with amongst the, the students in yeah, media? So, <laughs> um, no, I think I think it, that I, I, we cannot have one formula that works for everyone. And it depends what do you want. For example, for us in Eastside, I'm dying to make a 5031C non for profit. But I have to think where I'm going to do it because if I do the non for profit in the United States, then the money I will get is from the US. And for that project, that will look really bad. So this is a dilemma we have. We're thinking if we do it in Europe, but because in Cuba, I, I said to the, to the group team, you know, the people working in the start, the family, that we wanted to wait to be the first institution legalized. But you know this is not happening anytime soon, and and of course we want to to see if we can apply for grants and so on. So so yeah, it depends what uh, the money or the access to money and to recognition means for the project. I don't think it's good or bad to be a you non know, for profit or whatever. I think it's about how that information will. Uh, you know, inform uh, the goal of your project. And because who you receive the money from um, also informs what the project is about. So it's not only about uh, solving a problem, it's about uh, that. And the other thing is many times, as Susan knows, uh, non-for-profit becomes more than uh, more than a useful way of acquiring sustainability, creating sustainability for a project, they become sometimes, uh, they have a life of themselves where you are going cycle after cycle of grants, writing grants all your life, and then maybe you don't do the work, you know. I have known projects that were amazing that became not for profit because they thought, okay, everybody likes our project, we can have some grants. And at the end they disappear because they had to be all the time working, uh, doing grants so they can pay themselves. So they do the work and at the end it was only doing the grants, what they did. So I think it depends because you have to see the form um, that the institution you're creating is modulated after as part of your message. So it's not just doing it because the easy way, but it's, and also what does it mean that you're extracting money from certain things, you know? Where is the money coming? What kind of grants are you going to apply for? You know, how is the, the how you're planning to, 
to comment on the distribution of wealth in art or society, you know? So that is also part of, yeah. Yeah, I wanna say also that just to kind of parse out some ideas about economy, I think that, you know, that for artists, we have personal economies and that's sort of the fundamental, how do you put food on your table and a roof over your head? And if you have a family, how do you take care of your family? And how, how do you plan to live? You know, what kind of clothes do you buy? What kind of cars do you drive? Um, and so I think that, that we, we have to figure out our, our different ways that we relate to a personal economy. And of course, there's ethics involved with that. Do you donate money? Do you, uh, do you have a job that comes from, um, uh, you know, a, a, a war economy? How, how do you, I mean, even a university for me is um, a bit of a problem in terms of, while I believe very much in teaching um, a large research institution like the one that I belong to now, uh, it has some real issues for me with the, the amount of money that we take from students to pay our salaries. That I think is, a, is an issue of personal economy. Um, but then there's also your project economy and Tanya's talked about that. And I have a fairly clearly defined or did, uh, it changes, but um, a, a project economy, you know, who I pay. I mean, it's basically a socialist model. Uh, it's basically people that need it um, as opposed to people who have, like me, another job. Um, and, um, and then there's projects about economies, like the Mill Project or other, I think artists are very good at commenting on uh, economies. And, and those tend to be quite often quite analytic. Uh, or, um, or I think they're about revealing um, experience and information that might not be as accessible or creating an empowered public sphere, a public commons. But, but those are, are projects that, that move into this idea of utopia or how do you create relationalities that work well. So I think those are different when we talk about economies of our project and maybe Alistair, there's others as you well, well, I was just thinking, actually, you know, I, I didn't really talk much about this pub that I'm in. Look, I'll show you, I'll show you a picture of it. There's it with a, I'm actually, it's a real, it's a real working pub. Um, and actually just picking up on what you were talking about, you know, one of the things we're actually looking at with this long-term project is what are the, what other kind of economies can we create that work better in service of, um, you know, a, people lower down the scale, let's say, or people who are, who, are, who are not in power? How can you kind of use and piggyback the existing systems, um, which I think is relevant to the question we, we have here as well. So Grasdale Arts is a, you know, it's a kind of an arts organization in a rural environment and the, doing social projects. And the pub, this village pub, that's been here for about a thousand years, closed down um, two years ago. And the village were worried that develop, you know, a developer would buy it and turn it into holiday homes or basically just, you know, kind of turn it into something that wasn't, um, uh, you know, for their benefit um, and just would create kind of more holiday houses. And basically they, the community registered the pub as a, an, an, a community interest asset. So basically, so, uh, which, is a, which is a legal holding um, uh, strategy and that allowed, gave us a window about a, a, a two months to find the money to buy the pub and take it in control of the village. And um, basically we did an equivalent of a crowdfunder called Lone Stock, where everybody invested in, in, in the local neighborhood invested in the pub. And you know, over a period of 28 days, 350,000 pounds was raised and they could buy the pub. And, and what they're doing is renovating the pub as a community by themselves um, but by making everything in it. So, you know, like everything, there's a workshop here, all the cups, plates, bowls, so on is made here. All the food comes from farms and, you know, kind of suppliers around it. It is creating a microeconomy of its own in resistance to, for example, the pub used to be owned by Heineken, a big multi, you know, multinational, which had no interest in the local community. And now basically here is a project which creates in a way the, the place of convening and making and decision making that um, you know that normally an art center would do. 
So in a way, it's a kind of it's a pub as art center where people make, people do, they convene, they come, they drink, they eat, they but but also they talk about politics and you know what other things in the village they could change and take control of. So um, I think in a way that, that that it's a very good example of how embracing the complexities of economy in a way perhaps that art hasn't done in recent times um, actually can offer interesting pathways which relate to the you know the question of these artists you know how which is really you know how does an artist make economy for themselves you know nfts might be another or is proving to be another and that kind of decentralized form of uh, of a con of financial economy is proving very fertile territory for artists who are not based in metropolitan centers for example there's a lot of nft artists emerging out of africa because you know this is a way they can have a stake in an art economy without having to move to new york um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that was probably just a, a, a you know an interesting example to show. Seeing as I was I was here, I mean I was actually here be today because I was showing the team from Manchester Art Gallery, showing them what it was doing, because in a way that it, so they can then also create another kind of economy in the building we have in Manchester called Platt Hall, which is in a way where, where again we're reinstituting that in a different form. So it will no longer be a museum, but a but a but a but a kind of institution that works for the neighborhoods around it and some very you know kind of disenfranchised neighborhoods of south manchester so that they can then use that as a vehicle for for agency um which i see i see as being actually having a lot of historical precedent in the you know things like hull house in chicago and toynbee hall and actually some of the um you know uh, kind of some of the institutions and in, older institutions in south america for example um and that also it kind of connects with a, another question we've got in actually from um, Lynn Hilling. Lynn, did you want to read your question? It's nice to have it introduce some voices into the room. I think you just need to take your sound. Yeah, yeah th thanks for the inspiring talks to Tanya and Suzanne. That's really great. Um, I mean, I first came across Suzanne in... Um, probably the early 90s when you gave a talk at a conference in Ireland through the auspices of a man called Ian Hunter. Do you remember? Um, anyway, we've kind of tangentially followed your work with the, the art group that I'm part of. But this question here is um, more about the art institutions, Manchester and the Whitworth, Manchester Art Gallery in the Whitworth. And I might say Platt Hall because I'm involved in Platt Hall as a volunteer. Um, just wondering how you're going to work alongside um, existing community organisations like the Arts for Health, Art Therapists, Community Arts, Socially Engaged Artist Groups in Manchester, of which there are many. The Whitworth, uh, you're all important organisations, I think, and can attract a lot of money, which much smaller ones find it quite difficult to do. And I kind of don't want you to replicate or take over things that are existing. So I'm just wondering what ideas you might have to link in with those groups. Is that to... Um, oh, you know, there are, to, yeah, to, how might you work alongside us or um, involve us in what's going on at the uh, Platt and Whitworth and Manchester Art Gallery? I think part of where, I, I mean, I'll start this, but it'd be good to get Tanya and um, Suzanne's reflections on because Tanya also um, did a project, a, a fantastic project at Manchester Art Gallery called School of Integration a couple of years ago, which um, might be might be relevant here. but. Um, I, I, I suppose the trajectory of where we're trying to go with Whitworth, Manchester Art Gallery, Platt Hall, these kind of big edifices, is to make them these, well, well you know, when I, when I talk about, for example, you know, Arti Util or the Useful Museum, is actually how can people use these institutions for their own interests? So rather than us simply inviting them into projects, how can they be used as mechanisms and how do how do we orchestrate that and i suppose you know the idea for platt is that it it, it kind of works in that way um so you sort of need to get it, it, it you know there's a very delicate balance of power 
um, in play with these, you know, with these operations of, you know, decision making and, you know, how, how, how do you allow people the space to do what they're doing? And I think that I think that's really important is that, you know, institutions need to, in a way, em empower and enable people to do what they're already doing better rather than to trying to get them to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do. I think I think there's a there's a very high value in that. And, uh, you know, just reflecting it on um, Tanja's project, which was basically um, giving the giving the gallery to um, people from all kinds of migrant communities to teach their culture to other people. So it was like the reverse of, you know, trying to teach people how to be English. It was it was actually sharing each other's cultures and giving them a platform and um, and and teaching that out, which was incredibly kind of um, you know empowering and and giving them agency, and they also got paid for it as well, which is you know important too. Um, so f from my my perspective, I I think that that is again this is the utopian ambition question as well, isn't it? You know, ideally you would have a museum or a gallery, you know, operating on these many many different registers with people using that institution you know, and, and gathering from convening in a way that, uh, that allowed, you know, allowed, uh, allowed, it gave oxygen to the kinds of organizations you, you were talking about. Um, I think also the trouble at the moment is that, you know, big institutions actually don't, they're really struggling for money <laughs> at the moment. Um, you know, especially, we you know, we've just gone through 18 months, which has made it even worse. And maybe, maybe that actually, maybe the future of these big organizations is to go down that pathway of collaborating more effectively with smaller local organizations rather than trying to kind of eat all the cake, which is what they normally do, is actually to kind of uh, decentralize the, the economy of the, of the museum. Thanks. Um, but Suzanne, I mean, you, you, I you've been working I, with us for a while now. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, carry on. Tanya, did you want to say something? Yeah, I don't know. Do you guys hear me well when I talk? Yeah. Because I don't hear you guys well. Okay, oh, that's good. We can hear you. Okay, so before also? Yep, before. Yeah. Okay, that's good, that's good. No, no, I, answering that question, I think it's a very relevant question. Um, in, in the case, well, first of all, I share with, with Alistair definitely this idea of how to make the institution uh, accessible in terms of being used by the community. And also as you, we did in the project, even trying to invite them to redefine what, how the institution could be useful for them, giving them that, that, that access. But of course, to be realistic, it's almost impossible to keep those projects forever. You know, for as much as we, push the institution and the directors <laughs> to commit forever on those projects. I mean, it's understood that the, the, the museums and, and all these institutions have uh, part of their, let's say, mission is to do, is to also explore different avenues that things can go and different ways in which you can talk about the same thing. So it's impossible to ask them, like, keep my project forever, you know? And um, so I think this also brings the question, at least every time I work with an institution, how can you do something with the community that will stay after the project is finished? You know, for example, the immigrant movement with the Queens Museum worked for almost 10 years. At the moment it's, it's gone, you know, but the, the immigrant community that was working there maybe not 100% of them, but at least 70 or 80% of them, learn some strategies, some tools, some spaces they were not allowed to be in before, that now they're invited to. So they keep doing stuff, even if the project is not there anymore. So I think it's more about that. It's not only about extraction or who do this or who doesn't do that. It's more about, like Susanne was saying, like. I said, you know, pedagogical moment where people learn not only about themselves and their community, but also about 
how can they keep doing, how to be autonomous themselves? How can they be autonomous and, and not depending from the institution? So the institution as a place where they find out stuff that they can later do on their own, you know? Suzanne, with Uncertain Futures, I think that it's an interesting parallel there, not necessarily with other organizations, but there are, you know, our kind of group of leaders on, in Uncertain Futures, you know, that, you know, they don't necessarily have an interest in the gallery in that way, do they? I mean, they, they kind of, it, it, it's creating this opportunity to use the power of the institution to convene, but they, they have their, you know, their individual organizations or strategies elsewhere. You know, I, I, this is a really complex question, I think. Um, I mean, one thing is you're talking about do inst can you change an institution? And, and my sad experience is that you can't, which is uh, you can change them peripherally and you can change them temporarily. You can definitely make programs, institute programs. I think right now at USC, we're undergoing a lot of transformation, a lot of hard work by a lot of people who share a, a, a set of values and, and interests that will change that institution. But in my experience, even as an administrator, or particularly as an administrator, um, you, you know, you leave and, and it changes. And I think that's one of the reasons I do temporal work is I, I like the pleasure of doing it. I do think that, that when, you're, when you're working uh, um, toward your best and other people's best capacity and aspirations, you're contributing. You know, you are moving things forward. And then of course, things like Trump will come along and move things backward. And I mean, in a sense, we don't have any choice in my mind, you, you, you work toward good. But I, I've given up thinking that if I create a new public art program for 10 years at Otis, it's gonna stay when I leave. And I do think, I, I wanna point out, however you can have impact that is more uh, you can always have impact on the intimate and individual level, the people that participate. But if you expect an institution to change and stay changed, I think that's a much more difficult proposition. But I wanna mention one thing that we are doing in Uncertain Futures and that gives it a little more potential. And that is that you, you build on, um, this is from a friend of mine who's now head of the NEA uh, Maria Rosario Jackson. And she once told me she was analyzing a project I was doing. And she said, you know, that small town, we went into a small town with my students. And over the course of a year, we transformed the look of the town. We brought all kinds of resources and stuff. And at the end of the year, um, things went back. Uh, the painting we did, you know, uh, faded eventually. And she said, you know, Suzanne, you didn't look carefully enough at the capacity of the institutions or the shopkeepers, whatever, that you were trying to change. And she said, in my assessment, that town of 900 didn't have much capacity. So no matter how much you, you put into it, uh, I discovered that working with the police uh, department in Oakland. At a certain point, the institution was like Teflon. You lob change at them and it slides off the surface. They didn't have the capacity to pick up kids from school, except to throw them in jail. They couldn't pick them up and take them to an after school program and then take them home. They didn't have that capacity. So in Uncertain Futures, we really selected women with a lot of organizational capacity and engagement. So that project will go on because uh, in, in some form, because at least in the lives of those women, it, it feeds into and supports their already existing activities and capacities. It builds on that. We didn't pick a bunch of people with very little capacity and say, okay, now you can be our advisors, which by the way, is what I think a lot of social practice people do. Yeah, and it, and in a way it opens up the question actually of where does the institution actually reside? Like where, where is, it? is it? Is it just the building, you know, like with the columns? 
in the middle of the city? Or could we think of these institutions as being more dispersed? So if you imagine that, you know, like the Institution of Uncertain Futures as a project at Manchester Art Gallery, you know, in a way it sits outside of the walls of the gallery. It exists in the institution of the city in some ways, or, or ideally in our utopian world would do at least. Yeah, if you want to think about, if you want to think about the art project itself as operating as a quasi mm. institution or as um, Tanya pointed out, a para, institu a para institution, but we, in a, the Oakland projects, we had real goals of changing the police department, changing the school curriculum and system, changing the treatment of teenage girls who were pregnant. We had, we had serious fundamental goals to make an impact on that city. And I'm not saying we didn't make it some impact. We certainly created a lot of relationality, a very strong, large relationality. And I, I think Tanya has got a very big goal of, of challenging the institution of the government. And she's got a lot of core relationality she's building up. The question is, like Allensworth or any of our utopian visions, do they do they maintain after we leave? And I, I, I don't think they necessarily do. I think it's very hard to, well, if you're like Smithson, maybe you have an institution that goes on. But um, I think it's hard to create institutions that continue. What's going to happen to Grisdale? after Adam leaves, do you think? Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, we, we talk about that a lot. And you, in a way, you have to grow <laughs> another, or maybe it just, you know, it, it stops or it turns into something else. Because often, you know, these things they do, they naturally turn into something else. And we would, you know, in a very way, we were talking about this today, because it's that the fact that it's very, it's, there's a lot more energy around when you're building something and you're making something and everybody's there you know they're trying to save something they're trying to make it and that construction is incredibly galvanizing but then when you've just it's up and it's running and you've got to maintain it mm -hmm. then you know you enter a different sphere um which you know question you know questions the role you know what the institution is actually for, you know what it's for and i think that applies to you know big museums like the Whitworth as much as it does to a a pub or a you know a village hall. Why well, artists are so involved in these kinds of activities because, and I just don't make any um, bones about it anymore. I like startups. I like inventing things. I like. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're artists and not. I mean, I could have easily been an academic bureaucrat. I was an academic bureaucrat in at, at moments, you know. And I think that. Um, but what I liked about being an academic bureaucrat was the opportunity to completely change curriculum, completely change faculty relationships and so on, hire new faculty. Um, so, so I think that, that rather than worrying about it, I think to kind of figure out how, what we do with our energy at the moment, at the time, and our relation, through our relationships with each other, I mean, maybe that's, that's enough. Yeah, you know. Tanya, Tanya, do you think about the future of Instar? I do, I do. And Instar is maybe the only project I've done that I want to last until the until something politically change. Because I also, it's funny because I created Instar not so much for now, but because I have the certainty that when things change politically, we need more civic engagement than now and more uh, institutions that kind of, um, you know, are, are checking, you know, other institutions uh, and making sure they're honest and there is no corruption and stuff like that. So so I also thought about, yes, it's not being part of this process of change, but even more important after the change happened. I yeah, want to there's some encouraging words then from Amelia as well to say this takes a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Don't give up. Don't, don't <laughs> yeah, assume yeah. nothing has changed. We're already, <laughs> but I've been into both I, I think Amelia is proving my point, which is impact changes people, you know, impact, and then those people go on to do their change. Yeah, yeah. Impact people. I don't know if institutions, the same that's or 
maintain themselves. I mean, I think I'm a little jaundiced about that. Maybe, maybe others are more positive about institutions. Amelia, are you more positive about institutions? No, not, I mean, I, I get your point, but peop, you can also argue that institutions are people to some degree. So I do think the whole point for me of progressive politics is to transform people so they transform structural power or structures of power. Spoken like an articulate writer. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, you know, that's the same for, 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 you know, for any of us, you know, we're, we're always pushing. But also, uh, but also I don't think institutions are made for having permanent relationship with them either. I think institutions are made for temporary relationship. I mean, between the institution and the people they serve. I don't think they are done for... And the problem with institution is when they create a codependency, you know, when they create a dependency with the people they're supposed to serve or for whom they are being created. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amelia has added the ultimate line, never trust institutions. Um, so <laughs> on, it's, which in a way is maybe a good note to end on. I don't know for someone who works in an institution, but um, it, it is now seven o'clock and that's the time we um, allotted for this. Um, and I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to Suzanne and to Tanya and to Poppy and Alessandra for organizing this. Um, and it's been really nice to see everybody here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us and um, spread the word because I think we will put this online recorded as well, yeah? Um, so, uh, and, and do have a look at- When is the pub opening so we can have the meeting there? The, the pub's open. When uh, is yeah. the pub opening so we can have the next meeting there? Yeah, come, <laughs> it's, it's gonna be open. <laughs> Bye everybody. Thank okay. you very much. Bye everybody. Thank Take you care. so much, everyone. Nice Bye. to see you, Tanya.